right, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Brooke Edmonds. I'm with OSU Extension and I've been helping to run this webinar series. So thank you to everyone that's joining us today. So I'm really happy that Weston is able to join us. Weston is my counterpart up in the Portland, Oregon metro area. He serves as the community and urban horticulturist for OSU Extension and uh, been up there since 2007. He manages the Master Gardener programs in Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington counties, providing research-based horticulture and pest management information to the community. And today he's gonna talk about this amazing project that he's a lead on, um, Solve Pest Problems. This is a um, IPM website that's going to help Master Gardener volunteers and the public um, make better choices and be able to figure out their pest problems. And welcome. So this presentation is about solve pest and weed problems. It's a planned information service for Oregon and the Pacific Northwest and beyond. And as Brooke mentioned, the point is to help general public, help master gardeners, help people who are working at uh, retail stores to solve pest problems and to figure out what to do and to hopefully uh, solve, like um, handle the pest situation and also manage, manage risk in terms of pesticides and other management activities. And uh, a preview of what we're gonna talk about here is uh, number one, I just wanna thank the sponsors that have gotten us this far. We've been working on the project for about five years in the planning stage. And let's just say we're uh, rounding third and heading home in terms of getting content out uh, available to the general public. Going to talk about the need for a comprehensive pest management information service. Um, going to talk about our, our purpose and the foundations that we're working on. Uh, take a little break and then tour some example content and talk about what's next in terms of the timeline and fundraising campaign. Before we launch into that, I'm going to ask Brooke to uh, launch a poll real quick here. Yeah, so what might happen on your screen, um, I'm gonna launch a poll where you get to make some choices. If you can't do it on your device, no worries, but you might be able to do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this right now. So you should see this box come up and it'll say, who has experienced a pest problem at home or at work in the last year? Have you seen animals, insects, plant problems, weeds, or invasive species? So we'll give it a minute because there's over 300 of you um, to see about your polling there. This is pretty cool. I see the numbers climbing. Are you seeing it? I know folks on the other end, they, they can't see it. So we're- Oh, they can't uh, see it. They can't see it live, I think. They get oh, their voice okay. and they have to wait and we get the- I see, and, okay, yeah. I'm sorry folks. So we have 249 of 320 responses. 78% of you have voted as of now and 81% uh, of you have voted. We'll give it another couple of minutes here. How about seconds? <laughs> In a couple, couple more seconds. Okay, okay. so we're gonna like end polling. Down. So let me end that. Yeah. And I'm gonna share that out. So you should be able to now see the results of everybody's choices there. If okay, you want to great. Talk about that and yeah. So um, the reason I wanted to do this poll is to show that everyone has pest problems. So whether it's animals like mice and rats, whether it's insects like aphids on your roses or uh, yellow jackets, plant problems like um, powdery mildew, weeds, gosh, there's an awful lot of those these days, and then invasive species like Japanese beetle and other things. So the, the point is that um, we all experience pest problems and it turns out that um, it's hard to manage them. They, they, it takes a lot of time and energy. And in many ways, that's what the Extension Master Gardener program is all about, is teaching people how to solve pest problems and take care of their property and take care of their families. Um, as we're going here, uh, now just returning to the presentation, uh, we've been working on this for about five years uh, in planning. And just a big thank you to all the organizations that have supported us so far. So they include multiple soil and water conservation districts in the Portland area, Metro, the regional government, the city of Gresham, the Department of Ag Agricultural Sciences, 
at OSU, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, Master Gardener Association of Oregon, and chapters uh, in the Portland area, Clackamas, Multnomah, Washington counties, the Oregon Master Gardener Program, Program, Benton County Soil and Water Conservation District, and individual donors. So um, thank you for the support. Really, really appreciate it. Okay, next slide. Um, when you do have a pest management problem and you go online, there's a lot of information out there. It's hard to know what of that information is reliable. It's hard to know how to interpret a lot of it. Um, there are pest control companies who are trying to sell something. There are non-biased uh, research-based organizations like OSU and other universities and so on. There's also like Joe's Gardening website and blogs and other kinds of um, personal information. The bottom line is that it's confusing and there's a lot of it. Also, uh, when people do research online, the information is not always mobile friendly. Turns out that these days, somewhere over 60% of the, um, the internet searches that people do are based on cell phones or their mobile devices. So really important that if we're gonna start from scratch in 2020 and have a website available for people that uh, we lead with it being mobile friendly. Pest problems happen. This is the brown marmorated stink bug, which is a relatively new pest to the Oregon area, Northwest. It's of about the last 10 years. On the left-hand side, uh, hold on one sec, I'm going to uh, have a little spotlight here. Um, on the left-hand side over here, you can see the distribution. So up and down the I-5 corridor, going out the gorge. Here's an example of the brown marmorated stink bug. They, uh, they are a, a pest on lots of different crops, um, some vegetables, fruits, ornamental plants, and so on. Um, so pest problems happen. The good news with regards to the brown marmorated stink bug is that the samurai wasp, a natural enemy from Asia, um, has found its way here and is starting to have an impact on the brown marmorated stink bug. In this slide here, the arrows show healthy eggs and the other ones have been parasitized by wasps, killing the, the stink bug before it emerges and damages pests. Also these days, it seems like there's just <laughs> an increasing number of pests. So uh, as stuff is shipped all over the place um, with climate change, et cetera, uh, we're faced with a situation that people have more and more pest challenges on their plants and also an increasing number of invasive weeds. Um, this one here is lesser celandine and I've watched lesser celandine in my neighborhood sort of gradually take over some swaths of land. It's a really aggressive weed that spreads rapidly by these um, tubers underground. It also has seeds. It also has little propagules in the, the, um, the ve vegetation that gets on people's shoes and goes to new places. And you can see here my thoughts about lesser celandine. It really is a tough weed to work with. Also want to point out that um, as the climate changes, that it's likely going to lead to some um, more challenging weed situations. So longer seasons, warmer weather leads to uh, longer seasons for the weeds as well, more seed production and so on. So what we can expect is that uh, with climate change, there's gonna be a proliferation um, change of the, the competitive behavior of weedy vegetation, as well as uh, in managed crops and landscapes, change of weed species in terms of latitude and elevation, change in phenology in terms of the timing of the processes um, and so on. So with that in mind, um, important stakeholders from across Oregon have requested that OSU plan and implement a comprehensive pest management website information service for non-agricultural audiences. Really important with that distinction in that um, OSU and lots of other um, universities have great information geared towards agricultural producers. Um, not necessarily towards general audiences who don't have a background in, in horticulture, don't have a, a background in 
using pesticides and so on. So our, our job is to really try to meet that or stem that, that gap and provide information for lay people. The purpose of solve pest and weed problems is to reduce the impacts of pests and pest management practices on people and the environment in non-agricultural settings. Uh, the idea is that we want to build the resource in both English and Spanish and address inequities in access to unbiased scientific science-based pest management information. So that's a um, um, project purpose that has been agreed upon by lots of different stakeholders from across the state. What we're really trying to do is to be forward thinking. So if we know that pests and weeds are gonna get worse with climate change and globalization, et cetera, we wanna help people make informed decisions. So identifying the pest and figuring out what they can do, keeping their families safe. Also want to point out that um, gardening is, I suppose, is more relevant than ever with COVID-19. So um, with OSU, we're seeing lots and lots of questions. Um, people are interested in food security, so growing food at home or in community settings. There's a lot of new gardeners who are learning by trial and error. And what I've noticed in answering questions from the public recently, there's a lot of people with a time on their hands to observe their plants and to care for them. And then in Portland, at least in the last uh, couple months, there's been some contaminated compost with a persistent herbicide. So a lot of really hopeful gardeners have put compost on their, their raised beds and the tomato leaves are all distorted and shrunk. So it's been a, a very difficult situation. A lot of people challenged to grow their foods. And then fortunately with OSU, we are here to answer people's questions. As we've been going with solved pest problems, we have a really wide range of support from a lot of different organizations. It includes groups like the soil and water conservation districts that I already talked about, but also really importantly, it includes like the Oregonians for Food and Shelter, which is in essence the pesticide lobby for the state of Oregon, but also the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. So we really have everyone under our tent with really wide ranging views of pest management and pesticides. And all of them agree that OSU is indeed the agency that should be um, working on this project to provide pest management information and that they're entrusting us to, to take the lead on it. Through the last number of years, we've done really extensive stakeholder engagement, um, getting Oregonians opinions about pest and pest management so that we can really meet people's needs. We have a steering committee, which consists of our funding agencies. We have an advisory group with key agencies like the Department of Forestry and the Department of Agriculture, pest management companies. We also are paying people from diverse audiences, so representing um, the African-American community, the uh, Vietnamese community, Korean community, and so on to participate. So we really want to make sure that this resource is going to um, be useful for all Oregon audiences, especially folks who haven't been involved in extension programming in the past necessarily. And then also we have a Spanish language advisory group as well. And fortunately along the way, um, my funders have made it possible for us to provide um, stipends in essence for diverse groups to participate in our process. Uh, really proud to say that um, in 2019, there was Senate Bill 844, which would have earmarked $3 million, excuse me, for solve pest and weed problems, sponsored by Senators Arnie Roblin, Michael Dembrow, Pam Marsh, and Brad Witt. Um, unfortunately, we weren't funded at that time. It was an honor to be considered, though, I have to say. And um, looking back in the timeline, that was the year that the Oregon legislature, um, there was a strike and they weren't able to pass a number of bills there at the end of it. Big bummer, but nonetheless, we are continuing the project. The intended audience for solve pest problems, solve pest and weed problems is this. So do it yourself, urban and rural residents public and private landscape professionals, retail nursery workers, so people who are answering questions in the aisles or at the help desk at nurseries. Of course, uh, master gardener volunteers, 
people historically underserved by OSU's resources, and anyone in the Western US looking for reliable pest management information. So in the map here, this shows the population centers of Oregon, uh, but we could extend that to Washington, Northern California, Idaho. It's really anyone in the Western US looking for reliable information. And here's a schematic that we know that the general public is a big chunk of the audience that we wanna serve. And then we also have liaison users. And those are people that we could train to then be like a, a concierge to, to share that information with the public. So that includes master gardeners, our many agency partners, and people who are working at retail stores. In order to make the information accessible to the general public, we are shooting for writing scientific content in the grade six or seven reading level. And I'm using this program called readable.io, dropping all of the text from a given page in there. And it gives us really handy scores like the Flesh Kincaid grade level score, the reading rating, an A, and the read with ease score. So that quantitative analysis of the, the text is really useful for us to help to, to crunch it down and retain the scientific integrity and the, the essence of the information that we wanna convey, but to really tailor it towards general audiences um, and not necessarily towards scientific um, professionals. We've done some user testing with our, um, our information so far. We did a round of user testing last December where we validated our approach. We paid a recruiter to help us to find people who had no experience with OSU or pest management. Um, we paid an incentive for those people to participate. We were able to do 10 interviews with people with high school education or less. And all those people, one of the defining criteria is that they had a pest management need in their home. And with four of those families, they led us into their houses and we were able to do interviews there and they showed us around, they showed us some of their pest management problems, they showed us where they were storing their pesticides. And let's just say there, there's a lot of opportunity to help to educate the general public about pest management and really specifically about pesticide safety, storing them in proper locations, disposing of materials properly and that kind of stuff. This summer, we're launching on another round of user testing, and that will be looking at our final template, basically, and our evaluation tools. Really, really valuable information that we have gleaned from this user testing process. Here's a word cloud of some of the pests that our user, uh, our audience has put out there. Um, so for here in the Portland area or the, in Oregon, yellow jackets, ants, dandelions, rats, fleas, white flies, codling moth, blackberry, moss, box elder bugs, house flies, tree of heaven, chickweed are among the pests that people deal with. Another really interesting finding from the user testing is that OSU is already a trusted brand and uh, that's awesome. So here's a quote, I trust OSU, I'm living here and I know it's a university. That's the first thing I see on the website, who is the owner of the website? So that um, gives us confidence that uh, because OSU is the lead agency for the information service, that people are going to trust us. And the words and the logo makes me trust the website, the way it looks, et cetera. So um, the bottom line from our user testing is that uh, we're on the right track, that the, the, the uh, approach we're taking, having a visual information delivery, having a really simple language is worked for our intended audience. So uh, for example, what we're trying to convey to folks uh, in this example is yellow jackets. We want people to correctly identify the pests. That's the first step. And they we want them to understand what their options are and both the non-chemical methods. So with yellow jackets, for example, lure traps work really, really well. They use a scent to attract yellow jackets to a container. They fall in, they die there. Um, using a spray designed for nests um, comes with a lot of risks. You could get stung many, many times if you are trying to spray a nest. 
And also really importantly for yellow jackets, specifically safety information. So what about people who are allergic? So we have brought together all that information on a specific page on yellow jackets. Another example for you is mice. Who's got mice or rats in their ho home or in their shed? So identifying it, what are the non-chemical options? In this case, trapping is a really effective way to handle them, provided you seal the structure and make sure that they can't get in and remove any food sources. Um, with rodenticides, they are effective, but they definitely come with risks um, in terms of secondary poisonings, in terms of kids getting the products and so on. And then also, really importantly, with mice and rodents, cleaning up the material, um, health risk. You want to soak it down with a bleach solution, use gloves, probably use a face mask as well in order to uh, clean up a rodent mess. Another example of our approach for you is with ivy and identifying it. It's that really waxy, crazy vine that grows all over Western Oregon um, in terms of um, non-chemical methods. The approach is to start with the trees and try to cut it so that it's not growing vertically and producing berries that are spread by the birds. There definitely are um, herbicides that are effective for ivy, but it's going to take um, sort of specialized technique. And then lastly, where is ivy in Oregon or in other locations? So for invasive plants like ivy, <clears throat> we're providing um, maps with, uh, from the Oregon Department of Agriculture that shows that ivy is located in Western Oregon. It's not in Eastern Oregon based on the climate, but if people were to see it in any of the gray areas of the map here, we'd provide ways for them to report that information. More about our approach is that we're looking to help people to reduce the risks of pesticides, both to applicators and incidental exposures. And for example, we already have great draft content written uh, by OSU's pesticide safety program, Casey Buell. Um, it, using pesticides includes risks of harm to your family. And we include information about how people can manage or mitigate those risks. Reduce the risk of pesticides to waterways. Similarly, we have draft content already about steps people can take to keep from um, keep herbicides specifically from getting into waterways. So for example, over here, don't apply herbicides to steep grassy areas that are irrigated because they could run off into the street and then into a waterway. Also, uh, we want to provide strategies for people to reduce the risk of pesticides to pollinators. Um, here in Oregon, there's a legislative charge to improve pollinator health through House Bills 3361 and 3362. And we've been working with our pollinator health specialists to include content really specifically to help people um, manage the risk of pest management practices to pollinators. And it starts with opening, reading the, the label and looking for key information about um, protecting pollinators. Just more about um, the work that we've done to date, and that is we have a really detailed evaluation plan and draft survey instruments and so on. We'll be doing before and after surveys. We'll be doing website abandonment surveys. So in essence, um, we have thought it through. This is a logic model. Any of you in academia know like logic models, a first step to really um, plan a thorough evaluation plan. We've also thought quite a bit about marketing. So um, we don't have anything on the street yet, but when we do, we know that we'll be able to leverage our partners and existing relationships. Uh, we'll provide social media prompts and that other like master gardener associations or retail stores or other um, agencies could share that. Um, we'll provide postcards and bookmarks that master gardeners could share out in the community at, at community events when they're tabling. We hope to work with retailers to provide prompts there. So if there's a placard in the pesticide aisle of a retail store and it brings up solve pest and, and weed problems, hopefully that provides a, an opportunity for the customer and the retail store worker to be on the same page, to be able to discuss what are their options for dandelion or for other problems. 
And then um, we'll be providing training for partners and master gardeners and retailers. So it probably would be an online training. It would be like um, teaching people how to use the website so that they can share it with other folks. So with that in mind, um, want to take a quick break and ask Brooke if there are any questions from the Q&A. Hey, Weston. So I'm looking through, let me drag my little Q&A box over here where I can see it. Um, there's quite a few questions, but they're more specific to somebody um, trying to manage their own garden problem. So um, just a, a reminder, like this webinar is talking about this project as a whole. We do have a, a link of your questions. Um, we can try to do our best to answer them after the fact. I'm also going to put a link in the chat where you can reach out to um, your Oregon Master Gardeners. If you're from out of state, you may be able to find your local Master Gardener group or the National Ask an Expert system where you can type your question in and it gets routed. Depending on where you live, it gets routed to experts in your area. Um, and I would just say there, there are trained people waiting for your question through Ask an Expert and through the Master Gardeners. So for those of you who have specific questions, um, get a hold of us. We have people who really uh, want to help you. Yeah, so I'll put those in the, in the chat in a moment. Um, Deb does have a question. So Deb's asking, will it be possible to use the resource offline when going to a low cell service, you know, to access that information? Sure, um, we've definitely heard that from folks. Um, hopefully um, internet connectivity will um, expand over, um, you know, coming years in rural areas. But uh, the thought is, yeah, we could certainly make it available on a thumb drive or something like that so that people could load it onto their computers. Okay, and then just uh, maybe two more questions about sure. the program itself. Veronica would like to know, is there gonna be a phone app for the program? Um, it will be a responsive design website that will work on desktop computers and also phones. And there will be slightly different designs for the phone, which is a really narrow small screen and a regular computer. So um, the answer is yes, it will work for phones. That's the whole point. We wanna start with that. And then we also want to make it so that people who are using their laptops or their computers, it works uh, sort of um, optimized for that platform as well. Nice. Oh, I'm glad to hear that you won't be having to scroll side to side. It'll just fit your phone or whatever. It'll fit tablet. the phone. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then Carolyn has a question and maybe you already talked about this. What's the estimated rollout date for this? I'll get to that. Um, January 2022 is the time that we hope to have hundred or more content pages out and available for the public. So um, this is a, a lifetime project for me or a career project. We've, or, we've been planning it for five years and we're in it for the long game to make sure that we bring it home and make the information available and then maintain it over time. And um, fortunately, OSU proper extension proper um, understands the value of it and they're supporting me and taking on the project. project. Great. Okay. Um, maybe you can continue and then we'll pull some of those more questions at the end. Sure. Perfect. All right. Thanks folks. Here we go. So uh, we're going to tour some sample example content here. Um, this would be a mock-up of a landing page and um, the important things to know. So effective low risk solutions for Pacific Northwest pests and weeds. We're focused on the Pacific Northwest. Um, with pest management, you really have to be regionally focused because pests differ by area. Um, identify and learn about pests and weeds. Determine if action is needed. Some pests need attention. Some can be left alone. That's a really important point. Um, just because people have a weed in their garden doesn't necessarily mean they need to control it. Sometimes weeds are great at attracting beneficial insects. Is it something that you can tolerate or not tolerate? Learn how to get rid of the problem and understand any associated risks with various control options. Like I said, we're really trying to lay out the risk reduction strategies. And then after taking action, learn about um, steps to prevent the problem from coming back. It's really taking people through the process of integrated pest management, identifying it, weighing the options, understanding the risks, et cetera, 
implementing a strategy, and then monitoring that strategy over time. Um, more from the homepage here is like um, a, a way for to break out. People will be able to search so they could type in dandelion and they would find the page pretty quickly. We also have a visual navigation system, mice, rats, and wildlife, insects, spiders, and so on around your homes, weeds, lawn problems, mold, moss on patios and roofs, plant problems, and then aggressive and invasive species. Also, uh, we'll have a button and if um, people can't identify their problem, they'll be able to get help. And in this case, it would take them to, you know, OSU extension, but also to national extension websites so that people could find local people ready to answer their questions, just like Brooke and I mentioned a moment ago. We're also gonna have some specific um, guides associated with it. And much of this content is already in the draft form. Um, how to manage weeds without herbicides. We know there's a lot of folks who want to try to do that. In some cases, it um, makes a lot of sense. In other cases, doesn't make sense for um, particularly nasty plants. Solve plant problems without pesticides. So that would be fungicides and insecticides. Uh, we know there's a lot of folks who want to do that. And in a landscape, in a home garden scenario, it really is possible to do so. Um, urban and ho uh, property management guide. So really kind of different strategies for urban areas versus rural areas. We want to call that out and really uh, meet each audience where they're at and where they're coming from and um, what their specific needs are. Also, uh, we plan to have really detailed pesticide inf safety information. Um, it starts by reading the, the label instructions and following those directions and paying attention to words like caution and warning, danger and hazard, precautionary statements. We want to um, help people to protect themselves in terms of wearing the right gear, washing their hands after handling pesticides. We want to help people protect children and pets. So keeping kids out of um, lawns that have been treating with herbicides. Don't track products into your home on your shoes and clothes. Um, don't spray on hot and windy days because it can have, it can drift and damage nearby plants. We've already talked about how to protect pollinators. Um, don't spray in water and then storage and disposal information. So right now, um, all that information is available out there. Uh, we're trying to put it together in one place where people can see and they can see icons. And then each of these chunks would basically be a cell phone, cell phone screen sized chunk of information. Here's an example page, Tree of Heaven. Anyone have Tree of Heaven on your property? I'm so sorry. In this case, it's Tree of Heaven growing right next to a building, starting to damage the, the foundation. So we're gonna have an overview, like just all the basics that people need to know about Tree of Heaven. We're gonna have keys for success. So the most important management information. And another idea is that we're gonna have this um, feature called the risk card. Um, what's the risk of Tree of Heaven to people? Kind of low. To property, high. To pets, none. Annoyance, very high if you've ever tried to manage Tree of Heaven. Environment, very high if you've uh, seen Tree of Heaven escaping into natural areas. And then really importantly, action recommended. For Tree of Heaven, absolutely, action recommended. For dandelion, I don't know, you tell me, is action really needed or is it not needed? Um, included on each page will be really specific information laid out in a visual way for people to identify the pest, in this case dandelion, the leaves and the flowers, the jagged leaves, the seed balls, the sort of the general habit of the plant, another button for contacting master gardeners, and then um, the taproot. So one example of how to identify and then also we want to call out the lookalikes. Um, so yellow jackets, they're a pest. And especially if you're allergic or if you have a nest near your home, you probably want to deal with it. But people see a um, hymenoptera, uh, you know, like a bee or a wasp, 
And a lot of people, it gets them nervous. So they've been stung before, they know it hurts, they're afraid for their kid, et cetera. We wanna call out the lookalikes like honeybees and bumblebees and paper wasps and let no folks know that those are all easier to live with than yellow jackets and that if they can, they should really tolerate them, please. Also, we'll have um, reporting information. So for example, with Tree of Heaven, this map shows the Tree of Heaven distribution in Oregon. Yellow is limited distribution. And we are referring people to the Oregon Invasive Species Hotline. And in some cases as well, we're gonna refer folks to the Washington State Invasive Species Hotline. But the idea is like, we know we have citizen scientists out there and we wanna provide them with a way to understand the distribution and report it if it's out of um, known areas. And then take action, question mark. Some pests absolutely wanna take action for mice, um, tree of heaven, etc. Other things, not so much. So with yellow jackets, for example, if there's a nest in the back corner of your property and you can tolerate it, um, you, please do because yellow jackets, believe it or not, actually have a pretty valuable ecological role. They're predators. They are recycling uh, protein and other things into the environment and so on. But we wanna make sure all that information is clear. So yellow jackets are attracted to food and garbage. They sting people, it hurts. Do they cause harm? Yes, it can be a health emergency for people who are allergic. Do I need to take action? That's up to you, depends on the situation. Do they have benefits? Yes. And then a call out here about safety information as well. Our top tip for pest management especially when people are gonna use pesticides is to read the label and follow the directions. And um, this is sort of a screenshot of one of the features and people could click on this and learn why. So it would be an overlay, it would take over their screen and there'd be really specific information for people to learn why reading a pesticide label is a really key uh, practice. Um, how to choose and hire pest management Professionals is also another set of information. So for example, with termites, uh, really if people wanna to try to control them, we recommend folks contact a pest management professional. We'll provide de detailed information about how to go about choosing one. Another um, really important feature that we're working on is to compare management methods. So this is for yellow jackets and we're laying things out as non-chemical methods and as chemical methods and lure traps, really effective, probably your very best way to go, set them up between a yellow jacket nest and your picnic area, and um, hopefully you shouldn't have any problems. Um, yellow jacket spray for nests, um, certainly available widely, but kind of dangerous to use. Um, I personally have been stung every time I've tried to use a yellow jacket spray on a nest. Um, and then also bait products are available for yellow jackets where um, foraging yellow jackets take a poison back to the nest and kills the entire colony. So those are the options and we're um, laying them out side by side and detailing the risks and the benefits and the um, sort of pluses and minuses associated with each one so that people can make their informed decisions. And then preventing more yellow jackets. Uh, gosh, keep your food covered. Um, don't have garbage exposed where they're gonna be attracted. When you have apples falling in the fall, um, they're gonna attract yellow jackets. And then locate yellow jacket nests and stay away from them. Don't swat yellow jackets, etc. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for yellow jackets, for mice, for other situations where there is a health concern, we're also gonna call, that, call out that information and make it possible for people to understand um, when they should call 911 if someone gets 20, 25 yellow jacket stings. That can become a medical emergency when people are allergic and so on. Learn more, it would be an overlay um, and provide people with that those details. 
Okay, so that's a tour of the information, um, just sort of circling back to the, the project in general. Right now, the funding that I have is to develop a set of English language content, prioritizing the main kinds of pests that people are experiencing. Um, eventually, we do want to translate the content and have it available in both English and Spanish. It's one of the foundations of our program. Fortunately, that component of it's unfunded. Um, it would have been funded by our legislative bill, but right now we don't have money for it. But I am seeking funding via future grant applications for that component of the project. In terms of our um, timeline, so right now, here we are, July 19th. We have a proof of concept in hand and about 40 pest pages in their final draft form. I'm about to submit them to uh, OSU for peer review. We're gonna continue to develop content this year. Hopefully, um, January 2022, we will launch for the public 100 plus pages of content. And then we know that that's not all the pests that we're gonna be able to do. There are many more. We're working on developing um, fundraising so that we can cover the breadth of pest challenges that people face here in the Northwest. In terms of our funding model, uh, the College of Ag Sciences has given me license to spend half of my time working on this project. And they're also providing a little bit of cash for base costs. Um, my regional funders, Metro, the Soil and Water Conservation District, City of Gresham, they have already contributed, I don't know, $400,000 over the years towards the project and are going to continue to do so to cover for base costs. And um, as of now, we are initiating a statewide uh, fundraising campaign to specifically for content development. And my estimate of per page cost is about $1,000 to develop an English language page. So that's all the research, it's finding all the photos, it's writing it, it's fact checking it, it's editing it and so on. And then about the same amount of money, $1,000 to translate that content into Spanish. So uh, total cost is about $2,000 per page. Um, I have a program website. It's called, uh, the URL for it is solvepestproblems.org. I'm gonna share this presentation with Brooke and she'll be able to post it. Um, this would be a live link and you can find yourself there. So on that website, we have information about the project, um, all of the various reports that we've provided for our funders to date. We also have a way for people to subscribe to email updates. I'll be sending an email update for uh, our wide audience of, I don't know, 150 people who are interested in the program pretty soon here in August. Um, also on that page, there's easy ways for people to donate through the Agricultural Research Foundation. So this is a tax deductible donation that people can make. Um, they can send a check. They can donate via PayPal or with their credit card. Um, so again, those details are located here on the solvepestproblems.org um, website. It's a project website. There's not content there, but it's a description of our work to date. And then just to summarize, um, so again, thank you to our funders. This has really been an incredible opportunity for me to learn deeply about pest management needs, about website development. Um, we're very much on the right track and it's um, empowering to know that we're getting close to being able to have information for the public. Um, there's a really strong need for comprehensive pest management information service where people can find everything they need in one platform. Um, I explained our purpose and the foundations that we're working on. You saw some example content and what's next. So now's the time. Could... Um, Put it back to Brooke and see if there are any questions. Great, thank you so much, Weston. Um, I wasn't able to get that website up, but I'm gonna put your blog site in the chat and all of these um, links, the link to the recording, um, you'll get a follow-up email within a day or so once the video processes. So no need to try to capture everything that's going through the, the chat on links there. Great. Okay. 
So let me pull over our questions. So again, um, I'm gonna focus on the questions that are related to the project. There are quite a few um, specific questions on managing pests and we'll, if we can follow up later offline, I'll do that. Otherwise, um, there'll be some links sent to you. You can ask your question in the National Ask an Expert or contact your local um, Master Gardener plant clinic in your county. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of jump around here Yep. Because um, there's a bunch of questions. There's 48 questions in here. We're not going to be able to, unfortunately, answer all of them. So I was going to kind of jump around a little bit. Okay. Um, so there was a question about, let me try to find that. Um, so Mark has a question. Why aren't you using Latin names for plants? Um, were there some decisions made on, you know, choosing common names for things? Okay, so the, the main title of the website definitely is a common name um, right under the sort of the um, featured image will have the scientific name as well and also the plant family. Great. So it is included and it also would be um, when people do internet searches, it's high up on the page so it would be included in the uh, internet search people do. And then I'll also just frame it like, um, we are framing this for the general public. We're not framing it for um, already knowledgeable, educated folks. Yeah, because that could be a little intimidating, I guess, if you're, you know what the common name is, it's a yellow jacket, but you might not even know what the scientific name is or what a scientific name is, even. The yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Evelyn has a question. She'd like to know, will the website have a plant ID component or a link to one? That's a good question. Um, I'm definitely working on a visual way for people to identify weeds as a pest management challenge. In terms of plant ID for um, ornamental and um, landscape plants, that's beyond the scope of this project. And there are a lot of um, other apps out there that you can get depending on what device you have or even, you know, using like Google image searches that might be able to help you on that. But yeah, this is a big project. So that would be a whole another, a whole that's, other game. That's beyond our scope at this point. <laughs> um, Tony would like to know if you could just let people know how valuable this project would be for all of Oregon. Um, just thinking about where a lot of our information comes out. I'm in the Willamette Valley, right? You're in the Willamette Valley. Um, how would this benefit our whole entire state? Sure. Well, um, we are looking at pest challenges across the state and including those. So specifically, um, I've included, at least in our first draft of, of content, some weeds that aren't growing here in Portland, but are more from Eastern Oregon. And that's where, um, you know, if you all have specific pest management needs in Oregon, let us know what they are and we will include them as we start to build out content. Um, going back to the formats that this will be offered. So Monica has a question. Will there be a printed version of this for those that might have limited digital access or abilities on computers? Uh, yeah, each page people would be able to um, make a print version of it and print that if they want to do it. Um, it'll, it would take a lot of paper, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it's certainly going to be possible. Diane would like to know um, how well or heavily illustrated the site will be. Uh, they found that identifying weeds, plant problems, insects is much easier if there's a lot of different images to compare. Um, there are a lot of images um, on each of the pages. So um, I'm using lots of different sources, Bugwood and the Creative Commons and also purchasing some images as well. So um, the idea is that we want to make it visual and make it possible for people to explore it without reading. We know that people don't really read websites. They scan and skim websites. And the way that the anchors of that are pictures and photos. And then where I can't find an appropriate image, I'm taking a lot of images myself. And then um, where we can't do that, we would certainly pay to someone, have someone do an illustration where appropriate. No oh, fun. Um, 
so there's a couple of questions about the funding of this yep. project. So sure. um, Monica wants to know, you know, you have all this list of funders. How do you maintain um, neutrality in this? Um, and I guess that maybe that goes back to the Master Gardener program and, and OSU as well. Sure. Um, we maintain neutrality by providing research-based information. So that's the key that everyone agrees on. You know, we have pesticide industry. We have um, people who are looking for alternatives to pesticides. They're all agreeing that this information is really important. And we basically, uh, in an unbiased way, lay out the options for people without judgment and let people make their own decisions. So we do that by just sticking straight in the middle of research-based information. And that really is the mission of OSU Extension Service and the Master Gardener Program. Um, a couple of questions on offering this in other languages. Sure. Um, so you might have mentioned this already, but will there be links for if there's a Spanish uh, user for them to contact someone that could help um, or is there um, like screen readers that can do translation into other languages? Are those things that are being considered? Sure, yeah, we've, um, we've been considering all of those things quite a bit. So at this point, uh, OSU doesn't have huge capacity to answer questions in Spanish, um, though I do will say that as of right about now, I now have a, a horticulturist who's working on my team in the Portland area who speaks Spanish. Um, so presumably he could help. And what we're really hoping to do is to increase mm, the diversity of the Master Gardener program and the, the clients that we serve. So that would be a, a longer term goal as well. And then in terms of um, automatic translation, I've worked really closely with my Spanish language advisory group and basically asked them very, um, very plainly, like, um, if we pay uh, to translate by hand a page, you know, it's going to cost X amount of money. If we set it up with Google Translate or an equivalent program, that obviously is free, but there's a cost in terms of accuracy and there's a cost in terms of um, unfamiliar phrases and um, things like that. So they have told us very, very specifically that um, they don't want auto translation for the Spanish language community. But nonetheless, um, our Spanish language advisors have been able to certify the and then weird audio uh, going on. Maybe check your connections really quick. It's a lot really staticky all of a sudden. Mm, don't know what's going on there. Okay, better now. <laughs> okay. Um, the bottom line is we've looked into auto translation. Our advisors have told us not to go that direction. In the meantime, in the last year, I know that auto translation has improved dramatically. And um, in the next year, it probably will again with uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm kind of hopeful that a year from now when we start to really look into translation that we can re, um, reassess that, that question. And, um, I would love it if we could not just have a um, auto translation to Spanish language, but also to the Russian community and the Vietnamese community and other groups in Portland. And auto translation does all that. And it's certainly possible to integrate websites with buttons for all of those different um, uh, languages relatively easily. Like the technology is there. It's just the translation is still lacking and fingers crossed that we can do that approach. Yeah, we are dealing with technical subjects, which aren't your typical translation subjects talking about horticulture. Um, Marta has a, kind of a question comment. Um, so a lot of folks in our society tend to only read little short snippets. And so you're um, suggesting in the project that you're gonna order your solutions into these small little packets. Yes. Um, are you going to try to do like uh, order them by efficacy or by safety choices? Is there, uh, or is it kind of consistent? Like you're going to have, um, you know, uh, baiting and trapping and spraying. Is it going to be a consistent format for each of your pests? Or yeah, definitely yeah. a consistent format. And it basically we lay out the non-chemical methods first and the chemical methods second as we're going through. 
Um, yeah, lots of questions. So Judy put a comment, right, that that sounds great and best wishes and people are really excited about seeing this happen. Um, I think what makes this unique is that, and if you're a master gardener out there, you have already living in this world where there's so many different sources and you have to cross check and go here and don't forget to go there. And this really just brings it all into one place and it will make our lives so much easier to help the public. And so I'm also very, very excited about this. Um, there's quite a few other questions and we're really running out of time at this point. So we'll do our best to follow up if they're project specific, I'll send them off uh, to Weston to see if he can answer them or maybe direct you to one of the, uh, his online site. And then you all get a follow up email and it'll be a link to the recording and then any of the links that were posted in the chat so that you don't have to try to find those again. Um, so thank and, you, Weston. You can't sure, hear all clapping, but we are. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you. And, and my contact information is here. So when Brooke shares the video, it will include a link to my presentation. Here's my contact information. Happy to address any specific questions that you have. And um, as I said, we are in the, the fundraising stage of the project. If you have any monies available to contribute towards pest management information service, we'd love it. It's tax deductible donations. Um, it will, the, with more resources, we will be able to develop more pages faster is the bottom line. Great, all right. So okay, thanks folks. everybody for thanks. joining us um, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Take care.